if you think about the last time you went to any kind of uh, clinic, any kind of healthcare clinic, and you called and you said, my doctor put a referral or I've got XYZ going on and I need an appointment. What was the first question that you were asked? Hello, welcome to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcomes Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions. And this week, taking a little bit of a break from the interviews. And what we're doing is over the last, I don't know, six, seven months, I've done a lot of talking, a lot of speaking, a lot of training around the idea of a cancellation or no-show reduction framework. Now, a lot of this is outlined in the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. The Audible version is now available as well. So we'll link to both of those in the show notes. But basically, I wanted to break down kind of my thinking and my thoughts around new business development. And this is probably going to end up being a series here at the at the show. And then maybe even do, we'll end up doing a, a webinar series or something like that maybe in the latter half of the year, maybe into the summer, especially like for private healthcare professionals, things like physical occupational therapy, chiropractic, stuff like that. There tends to be a little dip anyways in the summer with people going on vacation and out of town and travel and all that kind of thing. So maybe it'll be a good time to do almost a webinar series or maybe even a, a series of workshops or something on new business development for private healthcare clinics. If you're interested in that, shoot me over an email at rafi at rehabupracticesolutions.com and we'll just, you know, we'll start putting the program together. Um, anyways, I wanted to do a little bit of a kind of a breakdown of my thinking on the topic of new business development, in particularly starting from the positioning of a service offering or a clinic all the way through to a cancellation reduction framework, which again, we outline in the book. I've done a, a couple podcast episodes back. We did, I shared the interview that I did with Paul Wright on this idea of patient onboarding and as an example and using that as the example to show kind of this framework in action of what, what does it actually look like to start with a bottom-up approach and how does that lead to increased arrival rates, increased patient engagement, decreased no-shows and cancellations and, and all of that kind of thing. So if you want uh, a real in-depth analysis of that or a, a discussion on that, go to episode, I want to say it's 069, but we'll link to it in the show notes, the cancellation reduction framework. And that's just really me breaking down the inquiry call. So how do you handle a um, a patient calls the clinic and says, hey, do you offer XYZ or do you take my insurance? How do you walk that patient from that conversation of do you take my insurance or do you do what I need <laughs> all the way through to an engaged patient that's completed their course of care. So that's um, the cancellation reduction framework. In this um, in this show, what I figured I would do is kind of walk it back even a little bit before that, before the patient even calls and start with the important thing, which is the positioning, the messaging, what makes that patient call your clinic in the first place versus all of the other clinics that they could call in your area. And we did, a, I did a webinar on this maybe a year and a half, two years ago called Positioning Your Clinical Expertise. Again, I'll link to that in the show notes. But it's kind of, this show connects all those dots, connects the dots from, okay, this is, this is the strategy that I use. This is how I'm going to position or market the services that we're going to provide all the way through to this is the patient showing up in the clinic. So kind of connecting those dots from, okay, this is the idea of, of what we're going to offer to this is the process of marketing messaging, using a system to onboard the patient or the prospective patient so that they actually become a patient that has arrived at the clinic, has paid for their consultation, and is now engaged in a course of treatment. So, um, there are links to all of the resources and everything that's referenced in the show notes. 
I did do this as a video because again, I was kind of walking you through this, this framework resource that we have available in the download section of the website. Um, so I'm using some visuals and I, I probably reference a couple times. Well, if you look over here and you look over there, um, if you want the, the full experience, go to YouTube and it'll be, this episode will be under the, the full episodes playlist video and you can kind of watch the, uh, the actual presentation where I'm showing you the, the specific documents, how we position, how we come up with a positioning statement, for example, and the like. So without further ado, here is, um, we'll call it the cancellation reduction system, but I want to almost call it the, the new business development for, for uh, private healthcare uh, clinics. So here it is. I figured this week, since we've got a little bit of a break in the guests, we've got a bunch that are in process working through, and I'm excited to talk about those in the future. We're going to be doing a an episode on buying a healthcare practice. So we're going to get uh, Michael Pekatowski, who's been on the show before um, as a mergers and acquisitions consultant. We're going to get him on to talk specifically about you know, valuating a business and the steps to the steps in the process of buying a business and then what to look for when you're potentially purchasing or acquiring a clinic. So that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm excited about that. We're going to be doing an episode on uh, patient direct to consumer patient marketing. And this is kind of going to be in the same vein, but I figured since I don't have a guest this week lined up, or at least a, an interview that's not ready to drop for y'all, um, I would do, well, take a, a minute, really, uh, a shorter a shorter episode here to talk about a couple of the, the topics that we've talked about over the years, um, but that really have, have just come to the forefront recently. So um, if you've been on the email list, you've probably gotten an email from me about Paul Wright's program, his cancellation reduction system um, that he's put together. And I was actually able to be a, a guest, a guest speaker on that, a guest presenter, um, talking about specifically this idea of kind of a bottom-up framework. I know we've done a, a webinar on this in the past, um, but I figured it, it bears uh, repeating because one of those things we can always get better at. And the reality is the way we handle first calls or inquiry calls into the clinic really has a big impact on cancellation and no-show rates and, and that kind of thing. And the, the business impact that that has or the metrics that that impacts in your business. So what I figured I would do is just take a very brief podcast uh, episode here. And we're going to go over the cancellation reduction framework. This is outlined in my book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare, which is now available on Audible. If you are interested, you can go to Audible, use one of your credits and get it. And um, also go over this, this five keys for creating the ultimate patient experience. So the way I view it, the way I see things is that the cancellation reduction framework really is not the thing really is just a piece of a system that is built around really prioritizing the individual patient, their subjective experience within the healthcare service delivery process or the treatment process. And the cancellation reduction framework specifically as it, as it relates to onboarding new patients is really just a factor or a piece of that puzzle as opposed to the whole thing. Um, so you really need to start from the foundation. Side note, this is also being recorded via the video. So if you want some uh, visuals of what I'm about to talk about, or if I reference something like look on this chart, it's gonna be on the video, it's gonna be posted to YouTube at some point in time. So let's dive right in. I'm gonna talk first, let me pull up. So this is the patient experience blueprint or at least part one that we do with some of our clients. Now, I am a big fan of when it comes to, okay, we've decided we're going to market directly to patients for our healthcare practice, whether it be uh, using Facebook ads or YouTube ads or you know, TikTok, whatever, whatever the, the in vogue social media channel is, the fundamental principle doesn't change. And that is the, the marketing, the messaging 
and the positioning of your clinic does not change regardless of the channel that you're using. So for example, you are going to, and what we'll talk about here in a little bit, is what I call discovering your three elements, the three elements of your business, and it's kind of like the fundamentals of your practice. Now I've done a webinar on positioning in and of itself, and you can go check that out at rehabupracticesolutions.com, um, and this kind of builds on that a little bit. So, um, so from the foundation, we need to really understand kind of the strategy for our, our business. So for example, I'm an occupational therapist. I own a multidisciplinary clinic, which basically just means we're PT and OT. Um, so we have physical and occupational therapy, aquatic therapy, and some other subspecialties. But that's basically it. So the last thing I want to do is just market myself as we run an occupational therapy clinic, or we run a rehab clinic, or we run an outpatient physical therapy clinic, because that's very vanilla, very bland, and it, it's hard to connect specifically when it comes to um, direct to consumer, direct to patient marketing, it's very hard to connect that line for a patient of why they would see me versus, you know, five of the other clinics that are down the line or down the road in our city. So it all starts with getting a firm foundation. So what I like to say, and this is just, again, a copy of of the the ultimate patient experience blueprint we have part one available for free so you can go to uh, rehabupracticesolutions.com click on the the drop down for insights and there's a tab for like resources and downloads it's free you download it you're good to go so the purpose of this piece in and of itself is we want to take those if you think about the five steps to strong patient relationships which is what healthcare is it's a it's a human relationship or human experience we start with that attract and acquire, then we move to you know, establishing a patient in a plan of care. We want to engage them throughout the plan of care. And then the last two pieces are we want to amaze them, right, with our services and our outcomes. And then we want to retain them and the, the two types of retention there, right? There's course of care retention, which is just if the patient uh, is, it's indicated that the patient needs probably three, four weeks of therapy or, or, or treatment. I'm gonna use therapy a lot because that's where I'm at day to day in the clinic, but this applies for other specialties as well. Um, so course of care retention is just, okay, this pe person has had a, a rotator cuff repair or a rotator cuff injury, and the clinical evidence suggests, you know, four to six weeks of therapy, um, should be sufficient to kind of get them to where they're at, uh, at a level where they can self-manage or be ready for discharge. So that would be course of care retention, would be making sure that they actually complete that, complete that four to six weeks of therapy so that they're at the point where they can discharge into, with independence, right? Um, and then there's clinic retention, which is a whole other channel, which is, okay, I saw Sam Smith for their shoulder, um, six months ago, and now they're coming back to me and they've got knee pain and they want us to, to work with them on their knee pain. So that's the whole piece. But it all starts with that. How do we attract them? How do we acquire them? How do we get these people that need our services? It's not like we're hawking snake oil here. These are specifically, again, using my example of physical and occupational therapy. These people are in pain. They're experiencing real limitations. How do I find them and how do I communicate with them in a way that makes them say, oh, you know what, maybe this clinic has the answer or the solution to my problem, which is pain and limitation. So um, the part, the first part of this is just kind of discovering what I call your three elements. Now, um, this is not anything groundbreaking. This is not anything novel to me. This is just something that I have taken and adjusted for my own clinic, for my practices and, that I work with as a consultant. And then kind of tailored it for specifically for healthcare and ancillary healthcare at that. So what we have to do, let's say we're gonna come up with some kind of, whether it be a service offering or a treatment delivery method, whatever it is, some kind of message that we're gonna take to the market that says, we are, in my example, I own proactive rehab and wellness, we are proactive rehab and wellness and we will do X, Y, Z, or we focus on X, Y, Z. How do we do that in a way that is going to attract the people we want to attract and engage them in a way that makes them want to book an appointment? Before we get there, we need to understand what that delivery is gonna be. What, what is that service offering? Is it gonna be a, like a total shoulder uh, assessment? Is it going to be 
something like I did a lot of home assessments and home modifications work for the Department of Behavioral Health when I was a consultant for them. Um, is it going to be something we call it the uh, a home accessibility assessment? And if it's going to be that, why should I choose that versus um, aquatic therapy? Or why should I why should I choose focusing on the shoulder instead of the ankle or something like that? Right? You gotta the the riches are in the niches, right? So how do we how do we pick those? subspecialty areas or those areas of focus where we're going to deliver a specific solution for a specific problem. The first part is kind of understanding these three pieces. And I, I lay this out in an article that I wrote a couple years ago. It's called What Next or something like that. It's called Strategy, I think, if you find it on rehabupracticesolutions.com. Um, but it, it is made up of three fundamental pieces. The first piece is your clinical expertise, your knowledge, your scope of practice. Obviously, it doesn't make any sense to try to develop a service offering or a program in an area where you're going to have to do a whole lot of work to learn how to do it, right? <laughs> Even if the market is there. Um, step two is discovering the market demand. Is there a demand? Is there a need for this? And then step three is, does it fit within the clinic or your organization's specific mission, purpose, values? I am a big fan of mission driven organizations and not in the like the the woo woo you have to come find your mission and your your the way you're contributing to society no 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 like this comes very much from the leadership if you're a small private clinic like my clinic like proactive rehab and will rehabilitation and wellness is uh, mission vi vision their organizational purpose comes from me because I'm the I, the buck stops with me I'm the I'm the owner so it is an extension of my purpose in the world. And my purpose is to help people take the driver's seat of their own health care. That is one of those things I want to do in my clinical practice. So that, by extension, becomes proactives. Um, same thing is going to be for you. No matter what uh, area of practice you're in, what subspecialty, certifications, all of that, it all needs to fall under what your organization is going to do, the good that it is going to do in the world, and then you're going to need to be able to to communicate why that's the reason. Um, and maybe we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So step one, your experience, your knowledge, your scope. Obviously, um, this is kind of self-explanatory. You, If you have an area of practice where you've already developed some kind of specialized skill, that makes you, again, the reason why somebody might reach out to you is because you you have this special certification or you are the expert in X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Um, so, and basically what you do, what I have done with clients in the past, what tends to work is we'd look at all of this. We look at the market demand, we look at this, and we kind of put them down in a, a sheet like this. So um, here's your clinical expertise, here's the market demand, and then does it fit in with your purpose? What is the purpose of your organization? Um, so for example, um, I did a lot of my clinical work was upper extremity specialty rehabilitation. So anybody that came in when I was at the Department of Veterans Affairs with like neck to fingertip um, that wasn't fixed with primary care uh, or even some other rehabilitation came to our clinic. So my clinical expertise was very much musculoskeletal. I ended up working in chronic pain, chronic musculoskeletal pain, that area of practice. So clinical expertise for me would be, okay, chronic musculoskeletal pain, upper extremity dysfunctions. The market demand would be, is there a market demand? <laughs> are there clinics, referral sources, patients that are in pain? The answer is, is yes. Um, and then you want to kind of begin outlining that. Okay, how many orthopedic clinics are there in your area that are refer currently referring to physical and occupational therapy? How many of those do you have relationships with? How many patients per year in your city receive some sort of orthopedic consultation or musculoskeletal consultation? All of that. So all of that goes in the market demand. Yes, there's market demand for this. And then the last piece is your mission, your vision, your values, your why. Why are you doing this? And for proactive rehabilitation and wellness, our goal is to empower people to take the driver's seat of their own health care to overcome their pain or limitations. So um, that would be our three fundamental pieces. And then we use that to craft a positioning statement, which at the very basics, positioning is uh, 
discipline per market, for market. So it's one of those like we do X, Y, Z for this population. So for us, for proactive, um, oh, I wonder if I can just pull it up on um, the website. Let me see here. New window. Oh, here we go. And we're just going to go to my clinic's website, pro-activehealth.com. It's not the best URL, but it was the one that was available. Okay, so what do we do? We empower our patients to overcome their pain. So that would be our positioning statement, right? We empower patients to overcome their pain. Now, obviously, that's very specific, and we, we might even call it something else or, or do something else. I think if you come to one of our About Us pages, we've got a little bit more of a uh, of refine or a, a in-depth positioning statement. So proactive rehabilitation and wellness is a leader in physical rehabilitation treatment, taking a biopsychosocial approach. Um, in our OTPT practice, we empower patients to make informed decisions, become the drivers of their own healthcare, and to chart a holistic path to healing. So closing that out. That is our positioning statement in a nutshell, right? And we got to that by looking at the clinical expertise of my team and of myself, the market demand for that, and then our purpose. Our purpose in the world is to empower people to become the drivers of their own healthcare. So if we were to develop a specific service offering or a specific um, treatment package or something like that, we would want to make sure that it falls in these three categories in our um, in our clinical expertise and our market demand and our why. A perfect example of this is we just hired a physical therapist and her specialty, or she is specialized in pelvic floor uh, uh, physical therapy, PFPT, pelvic floor physical therapy. And that was one of those things when we were looking at, okay, how are we gonna market this? How are we gonna message this? Um, we looked at, okay, well, obviously her clinical expertise is this highly specialized area of practice. Um, is there a market demand? And we did. We discovered this basically by calling around, <laughs> and we we were told yes. There's an overwhelming amount uh, amount of demand for this. And then the next piece was: Does this fit in our greater mission, our greater organiza our greater organizational purpose? And the answer was absolutely yes. I mean, our our goal is to help people overcome their pain, to become empowered in their self management of that pain in the long run. A lot of what and I'm, again, this is not my area of practice, so I don't have a whole lot of insight in ha to what happens and how, how she does this, but um, it a lot of the treatment does involve patient education, self-management techniques, all of that kind of stuff, which falls right into our our area of, of focus as far as our organizational purpose. We want to empower people to take on not only the responsibility, but kind of the, the control of their healthcare this kind of specialty and this service fits right in with that uh, with that mission, that vision, that value. So when we described our the positioning statement for that specific service offering, it had to do with pelvic floor physical therapy and self-management and all that. Um, maybe I'll find that for y'all another day. So let's close that out. Boom. Um, and that takes us to, well, the five keys of the ultimate patient experience, which is also available. And this is really just kind of the 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 first piece that we just talked about, the three elements are your foundational pieces of the business of developing your service offerings. This is kind of the next step in, which is, okay, once we've developed that, once we've discovered what the service area or what the niche is going to be, for example, um, how do we begin implementing this in a way that is sustainable in the long run and that makes those human connections that we really want in healthcare? And it's just five, what I call the five, the five pieces or the five keys of creating an ultimate patient experience. And that is you implement a biopsychosocial approach. I, if you've read the book, you've, you've read everything I have to say about it, but I dedicate the first chapter of better outcomes, a guide to humanizing healthcare on a biopsychosocial approach. So we've also written articles about it that are on the website. You can view it there, rehabupracticesolutions.com. But we implement a biopsychosocial approach we focus on the human relationship. And again, this is kind of uh, the the illustration of that. We take a new patient or a new referral. They have an initial experience with us. They're a current patient. Throughout this relationship cycle, we want to focus on the way we communicate with patients and what their needs are in specific um, 
points on that relationship cycle with us so that we can build a strong therapeutic rapport, right? Done. Um, we want to focus on communication, and that's that active listening, the empathy, the friendliness, the encouragement, the nonverbal pieces of communication. We want to understand behavioral change. We want to understand that as clinicians, as healthcare providers, we're really in the change business. We are helping uh, patients or clients, depending on how you how you want to call them. I'm a big fan of using the word patient because to me, um, patient is very much brings it back to healthcare being a vocation as opposed to a, a career or a job or something like that, something industrial. Client to me seems really transactional. That is a side note. We're moving on now. Um, understanding behavioral change and understanding where at different points, again, along that patient relationship cycle, the different things that might be required of us in order to have a patient or to encourage a patient to become engaged in their own treatment plan. And then the final piece is just measuring and tracking that retention and that experience throughout the course of care. So um, if you think about the first piece that we talked about, discovering those three elements as your positioning, who you're going to serve, how you're going to do it for them, what that means. Boom. The next piece is, okay, here are the five things or the five steps or keys to creating the type of experience we want with our patients. And that, out of those two fundamental things, flows the cancel redu cancellation reduction framework, again, which I outline in the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. But looking at the biopsychosocial approach, building relationships, active communication, understanding behavioral change, and then obviously tracking it on the back end, but understanding those, at least those four pieces, really makes you question what we do in our healthcare businesses, in our practices. What I mean by a bottom-up approach, which I have outlined again in another webinar, uh, it's called, I think, Bottom-Up Approach, Direct to Consumer Marketing or something like that. Go check it out at RehabUPracticeSolutions.com. <clears throat> but if we understand from a biopsychosocial perspective that every patient is unique, every patient is different, then it is incumbent upon us as clinicians, as clinics, as practices, to really try to tease that out of the patients that are coming to see us. It, we're not just looking at, you know, 50 patients a day that are shoulder pain patients. We're looking at, you know, Susie Q that has this going on and their specific situation and their, their individual factors that are affecting their ability to manage their shoulder pain at home. And we're also seeing uh, Sam Smith, who's also got shoulder pain, but they're living in an entirely different social context or work context and we need to begin adjusting what we're doing or how we help this patient based off of their individual context so part of reducing cancellations part of making sure that our schedules are full is giving those patients a reason to show up again and again and again and part of that is making them know and understand that we're not just viewing them as a number on a spreadsheet or a check on a checklist, a, a box on a checklist, that we're looking at them as an individual, that we're tailoring what we do with them around their own specific context and their situation, and that in and of itself drives patient engagement. So, um, how do we leverage that? How do we do that? Okay, I outline this again in the book, but we're gonna kind of talk about it here. The purpose of all of this, again, is to, instead of being very agency or clinic specific, which is what most healthcare processes are, we're gonna kind of flip it on its head, hence the bottom up. So if you think about the last time you went to any kind of uh, clinic, any kind of healthcare clinic, and you called and you said, my doctor put a referral, or I've got XYZ going on and I need an appointment, what was the first question that you were asked? Okay, um, what's your insurance maybe? What's your date of birth? What's your name? Um, obviously we need your name, but what's your date of birth? Uh, your insurance, your, your doctor's information? Do you have a PPO? Do you have a PPO? Do you know what your, your copay is? All of that kind of stuff. Let me get your demographics, all the administrative stuff. Where's a good email that I can send you, you the paperwork, uh, if they're doing that even? Um, where's your address so I can mail you the 10 pound <laughs> patient new patient paperwork packet um, all of that and that usually happens first in the process we're gonna get everything that we need on the administrative side and then after that 
well, why don't you tell me what's going on? Maybe if there's time. It might just be like, okay, we've gotten all this out of the way. And what is the doctor seeing you for? Okay, shoulder pain. Got it. Well, show up on, you know, January 7th at you know 3.30 in the afternoon and have your paperwork filled out and we'll get you seen. All right, click, done. That's kind of the norm in healthcare. And part of it is because, understandably so, we need to get some of that information or else we don't get paid, right? <laughs> right? We need to get the insurance information. We need to get some of that demographic information. But the way we get it and the order in which we get it makes a big difference to the patients and their subjective experience. So what I've outlined in the cancellation framework reduction or the cancellation reduction framework is that what we do is we take that whole process and we start with the patient in mind. So the first step of this whole piece, specifically as it relates to for the example of a patient calling the clinic and saying, hey, I've got shoulder pain, can you help me? We start with what I what the literature calls the narrative experience or the subjective narrative experience of the, that patient. So we wanna ask open-ended questions, and what we want to get is the patient's story, their experience, what they're feeling about their situation. So it can be a question as simple as, tell me a little bit about what's going on. You've got shoulder pain. You know, How's that affecting your daily life? Um, is there anything you can and can't do because of the shoulder pain? Um, how do you feel about it? Is it? Does it make you anxious, worrying about whether or not you're going to drop something heavy or that you're not going to be able to play baseball in the backyard with grandkids, Wh whatever, whatever it is, you kind of just using active listening again, you're taking what that patient is saying to you or that prospective patient is saying to you and you're cycling it through. You're, you're reiterating it. You're repeating things so that the, the prospective patient knows like, oh, this person is actually listening to me. They actually care about what I'm feeling. I've had a chance to tell my story before they get to, do you have insurance? Do you take my insurance? All of that kind of stuff. Then from there, that's when you move to the, the, the referral information. So, okay, you've told me you have this, this shoulder pain, which is going to truck with a shoulder pain example, um, and it's really impacting your ability to uh, lift things over your head, to play baseball in the backyard with your grandchild. Um, how did you hear about us? Did you, did you find us on Google? Did your doctor mention to us? You know, what made you reach out to us instead of you know, the 17 other physical therapy clinics that are in the city here? Um, and they'll tell you that this information is super, super important because then obviously if it's a if it's a referral partner, if it's a doctor that mentions something, you want to be able to reach out and say, hey, so and so, thank you so much for sending this patient or, what, or whatever. Um, if it's one of those, well, you know, we found we found you online, we found you on Google, whatever it is, then you can start doubling down on some of those areas, those those content channels, which we we can talk about on another podcast, but content marketing for healthcare. Um, so you can double down on those areas because they're they're driving business for you. Once you get that referral information, so we've got their their subjective experience, their narrative experience, we understand why or what prompted them to call us. Um, then we want to get their goals. Okay, so you know, you found us on our on our podcast or on our blog, whatever it is. Um, wh what do you want to get out of out of treatment? Well, like, what's your what would your goal be? If I could just wave a magic wand and all your goals have been met after coming to see us, what would it be? You know, um, or how do you see X Y Z helping you? Right? Um, what would you like to be able to do after you see us? And it might be something like carrying on with the shoulder pain, like. I want to be able to throw the back, the baseball in the backyard with my grandchild without having pain in my shoulder. Done. We're writing that down. That's your goal. After the goals and kind of in line with the goals is kind of none of this needs to be like specific individual questions. Like you don't need to pause and say, okay, now I'm going to ask you about your expectations. It's kind of a, just a free flowing conversation. But okay, so we got your goals. You want to be able to throw the, the baseball in the backyard. Um, how do you see uh, physical therapy helping you to do that? You know, like, is there something specific that you've maybe you've read about or was it something on our website? Did you read one of our uh, articles that prompted you to call us? And what in that article specifically um, do you think is going to help you? Because, again, we want to get their narrative experience. We want to get their expectations for treatment. Because the last thing you want to do is end up with a patient who thinks they're getting X and you're really delivering Y. So you want to be able to get those expectations up front. Um, because all of this information gets given to the clinician, the treating clinician, before that patient shows up so that we can kind of follow up on all this information, but that's uh, down the line. So we get their expectations. How, 
what do you want to get out of treatment? How do you see it helping? Was there something in particular you were hoping to get? Maybe they want something like a dry needling or they want ultrasound or they want whatever specific treatment it is. You want to know that ahead of time because if it's something you need to address um, to reframe their expectations, you want to know that up front. Um, and then after that, after you get the important stuff, their narrative experience, why they, what prompted them to reach out to you specifically, their goals, their expectations, then you move on to the stuff you need to get them on the schedule, right? And that's usually where we say something along the lines of, okay, now we've got to get through all the, the, the boring stuff so I can get you on the schedule. Um, you know, what's your date of birth? Um, is there a day or time that works good for you? Do you have insurance? If you do have insurance, um, do you have that number handy so we can run uh, the benefits verification before we even show up? And that's, again, step two or three down this process here. Um, can I get your email or, and contact information? That way we can send you your online paperwork or that we can communicate more effectively with you. Um, get all of that out of the way. Okay, Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, we've got you on the schedule for next Wednesday at 2.30 in the afternoon. You're gonna see whoever the clinician is. Um, we're gonna hopefully look at really taking a, a, a holistic view of what's going on with the shoulder, what's causing you pain, and maybe coming up with a plan that'll work for you and get you to throw in the baseball in the, in the backyard with your grandchild. Are there any questions? So the next step is, are there any questions that you may still have that I have not addressed, fully addressed? Answering that question, um, and the patient might bring up something that is a, a potential conflict, a potential um, objection. Uh, we want to get get a hold of that beforehand. Answer that question, and then again, assure them that they've that they're in the in good hands, and that they've done the right thing, or that they've made the uh, validate their decision to book an appointment. Basically, because again, the way we are as humans, um, we make decisions emotionally, and then we justify them rationally on the back end. We want to provide that validation for them ahead of time, so that they don't get buyer's remorse essentially. And that's basically the framework for handling a new patient appointment. Now on the back end, I've kind of referenced this a little bit, you're gonna to wanna to do things like verify their benefits and call them ahead of time and let them know. We try to call patients 48 to 24 hours before their appointment, before their initial consultation and say, hey, we've called Blue Cross Blue Shield and this is what they say your copay is and you know we're gonna have this for you to in, in writing so you can sign it when you get here. I just wanted to give you a heads up or whatever it is. If it is somebody that is you know, uninsured or cash pay patient like myself, I don't have health insurance, I use a health share. Um, I like calling and saying, okay, how much is this gonna be upfront and how much is this gonna be every subsequent visit? And you can give that to the patient over the phone if you want to. Um, but we wanna make sure that we provide patients with that information, again, just from a transparency standpoint. Um, and that's basically it. Um, probably what I might do in the next bit um, maybe the in two or three weeks when we do another solo cast here, um, another podcast is talk specifically about healthcare content marketing. If that's something you'd be interested in, shoot me an email, ask me a question at ask answer. We have links to it now on betteroutcomes.show on raffysalazar.com. Shoot me a question and I'll, I'll answer it the best I can. Um, if you like the show, head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review helps people find us. Um, what else? What else? Oh, if you are a uh, private practice owner and you have uh, a need or a desire to up your marketing game, so to speak, head on over to marketing.rehabupracticesolutions.com um, and you can read about what we do, what I do at rehabupracticesolutions.com in this space of direct to consumer marketing and healthcare, content marketing and healthcare, and see if it's a good fit. Schedule a call with me. I'd love to have a conversation with you and see if there's some way I can help. Until the next time, folks, be safe, be healthy. I will talk with you then. Well, hopefully that shed some light, if nothing else, about my thinking on this topic of new business development, primarily in private specialty or subspecialty healthcare practice, where we've got just a different set of of variables when it comes to patients being referred to our clinic or showing up to our clinic. It's not like we're part of a big healthcare system. For example, there's a, a couple of big healthcare systems in the city that, that my clinic is located in. 
if somebody goes to the ER there or to their primary care physician in that healthcare system, the the mechanism of follow up, the way they they refer people within in their own system and in house, just makes that experience and that onboarding process a little different than somebody coming to you that's not really affiliated with your organization in any way. They haven't been to uh, your doctors or your hospital or anything like that. So there's just a different level of relationship there than there would be if you were a ginormous healthcare system that had multiple specialty offices and clinics and outpatient centers. And it was just, you're going to um, ABC Health, we're just going to their physical therapy clinic or their occupational therapy clinic instead of their you know, orthopedic clinic or whatever it is. So primarily, again, thinking about this in the sense of starting with a person-centered approach or what I call a bottom-up approach really changes the way that we should even think about obtaining the information that we need to do our job. So again, I know I've beat this dead horse to death again, <laughs> but the idea of what is the information we need, the demographics, the insurance, all of that, why do we need to get that first? Why don't we get the narrative experience or the subjective experience of that patient first, allow them to tell their story, allow to even make sure if there's a good fit for services before we even move on with scheduling. And I've, I've said this to patients when I have covered the front office in my own clinic or when I've been training people and somebody calls, I'll tell them, listen, before I get you on the schedule, let's not waste any of our time. Let's tell me about what's going on and what you have specifically in your situation. What are the limitations you have, the pain that you have, X, Y, Z, because it might not be a good fit for you to come see us. And I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste our time. So let's get that out of the way. Let's get the, the subjective narrative experience. I won't say that to a patient, obviously. I'll say, tell me what's going on with you. And then depending on what's going on, it might make sense for us to schedule an appointment. It might make sense for us to refer you to somebody else, but I won't know that until I hear from you what's going on. Um, and just that little shift. I mean, it's not... I, like I tell people all the time, you're still getting the same exact information. You're still getting the demographics. You're still getting the insurance information. You're still getting them on the schedule and getting the, the appointment on the books. But what you've done by taking the time to start with that person, because that's what it is. It's not a patient. It's not a shoulder. It's not a diagnosis code. It's a person. By giving that person the time and the freedom and the space to share what is going on with them, um, it allows for that relationship, for the trust to begin forming so that before the patient even shows up in the clinic, they're in a position of kind of heightened expectations. They already feel like the experience that they've had on the phone with your clinic and your organization is different than what they've had at other organizations and other healthcare clinics that they've used in the past. And they're a little bit more hopeful about the outcome or the potential outcome of the services, which Again, there's tons of research out there that patients' expectations of treatment affect clinical outcomes and experiences in the clinic. So anything we can do, especially as private healthcare practices that don't have the backing of a huge, giant healthcare system behind us, any little edge we can get helps. Helps with the, the marketing, it helps with the business development, it helps with the patient engagement. It helps with all those things that we that we need to keep the lights on, right? So hopefully that um, just talking about kind of going from the positioning all the way through to the, the landed patient, so to speak, or the conver converted patient, so to speak, uh, gave you some maybe some insights, some tips, some tricks that you can implement in your own practices going forward because that's what I'm all about, right? Something you can take away and use tomorrow in your practice. So if you like the show, head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. It helps people find the show. If you want to be notified when we drop new episodes, you can do that at www.betteroutcomes.show. There's links there to sign up for the email list. We'll shoot out an email kind of notifying you when the episodes drop, links to all of the resources. If we've got guests, links to them and their social profiles, or you know, some of our guests even give you their email address to reach out to. That'll all be in the email. And um, if you happen to own or manage an outpatient clinic, private healthcare practice, and you're looking for a way or a system to do exactly what I outlined in this episode, taking the concept of a potential service offering or a, even a potential clinic 
and crafting that positioning in the marketplace and then putting the system in place once you have that positioning through to what do we do with advertising, marketing, messaging, how do we get this idea out into the marketplace and then how do we use a system to capitalize on it to get patients to raise their hands and say I'm interested and then get them on the schedule in a way that ensures they're going to show up because <laughs> patients on the schedule that don't show up don't help you either. Head on over to marketing.rehabupracticesolutions.com. Um, there's links there to schedule a call with me and uh, we can have a conversation, see if it makes sense to, to take the next step. Uh, until the next time, folks, be safe, be healthy. I'll talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcome Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients, helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.